years ago, a third star was added above the U.S. crest, and they wore it with tremendous pride. But as soon as the last stitch was sewn, this extraordinary team was hungry for a fourth star. France was set to host a history-making tournament. The greatest depth of talent ever in a Women's World Cup had assembled and would play in nine cities across the country. For these USA champions, the story of the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup got kick-started with 23 phone calls. That's the, the awesome part of the job, is being able to just pick up the phone. And, you know, for some of these players, it's they're going back to another World Cup, which is incredibly special. But for those players, it's their first roster. I mean, you know, the emotions. And they bring out the emotions in me because of how they react. I was sitting in my apartment, drinking coffee, reading the paper, doing my crossword. And, you know, you see Jill Ellis pop up on your phone. So Jill uh, sent me a message early in the morning, and the message was, are you awake? And I go, uh, yes, I am awake now. I mean, I was half asleep, definitely. but. I popped my eyes right back open and was like, yes, call me now. Usually if I'm in PT and I get a call, I'm just let it go to voicemail. But I was like, I gotta take this, sorry. And she's like, oh no, yeah, go ahead. And she told me I made the team and I was really, really excited. I got the call and, and she just said, you know, I just want to congratulate you on making the, the roster. And, and I said, I'm going to do whatever I can to help us be on top of the podium come July 7th. For the new players, you know, just incredible, um, I think, relief in some part that they've gone through this, but also satisfaction on making, you know, something as special as a World Cup roster. I mean, you know, bless Jess McDonald, she, she couldn't speak. And I thought literally we'd ha she'd hung up or we'd gotten disconnected because I'm like, hello, hello, she, oh, you know, she couldn't speak. You know, you call a player like Carly and, and just what a special moment to go back to another World Cup. You know, the confidence in their voice. And so, I, yeah, it was a different amount of emotions. During the tournament, Jill Ellis would surpass the record for most U.S. national team games coached. Ellis and her staff designed remarkable strategies for each game but the selection of the final roster was also expertly crafted. In terms of building a team, it was a team that could manage different situations. Uh, I think we had to be tactically more astute just because the game had evolved so much. Um, and having players, you always want game changers on your field that you know, can suddenly turn a game. But having players that could play, you know, in, synchronized together, but also have that individual flair. So it was building a roster that had experience, that had newer players, players that could operate in tight seams, you know, goal scorers. There's so many things that are special about this team. I, I just think like the diversity in players like in age-wise, but then also um, in all of our journeys as well. But we all came together and I feel like everyone played their role that they needed to in order to win and we all executed really well. I feel like we're sisters and like we love each other and sometimes it's a love-hate relationship. You know, we don't always have to be best friends or agree, but we have to move forward together and that's what we did. Oh yeah, everyone was driving me, <laughs> driving me crazy. And I think at, every, at all points during her, everyone was having those moments and everyone knew it was just like, oof, she's in a, she's in a mood. Everyone kind of had that, like, even just that comfortability to say like, you're driving me nuts, get out of my face. The team became close, supporting and annoying each other like family. Meanwhile, the outside world started to speculate and talk about what might keep them off the championship podium. The defense drew a majority of the skepticism. I think what really fueled me after I was hearing, oh, you know, Crystal Dunn, it's a weak spot, teams are gonna go down her side, I was like, bring it. Like, I've never given anyone a reason to doubt my ability to fill any role. You know, that's, that's who I am. So, um, you know, looking back, I feel like it kind of fueled me in a way. I tried to push it all out, to be honest. I think my teammates have been incredible this whole time. They've shown me nothing but support um, from, you know, from day one. And I deleted all my social media before the tournament. And, you know, it's, it's five weeks of being in a bubble. And I knew the group that we had. I knew the people that we had together. And I knew, you know, the character of this group and what people stood for. Wanted to just enjoy the moment and, and be together and, you know, focus on the job that I had in front of me. My biggest annoyance was the narrative of them wondering, how's the back line gonna do? How's Alyssa Nair gonna do? This is her first big tournament. And I was, I was kind of surprised by that. I didn't realize that was a narrative that they were putting out there, but I had no doubt. And 
I told Becky before the first game, but I said, Becky, I'm so tired of having them push this narrative and having them ask these questions. And I said, we need to shut them down to shut them up. And people doubted us and we proved them wrong. The US team would face Thailand in their opening match. The game was scheduled on the fifth day of the tournament which made for a long wait before taking the field. Win up three, one, two, three, Woo! We were freaking like animals let out of a cage. Like that's the vibe that we all felt. We were so amped up. We were like, we, we have waited this long to you know, start our first game and it showed, you know, it obviously showed in the results that we got everybody involved. Everybody was sharing the ball and um, we just, we were relentless. We wanted to score every, every time we touched the ball. Going into the first game, I think that we were all so ready. Like, if you could ever be overly ready for something, that was us. And we were just ready to go out there and, um, and win, play our hearts out, start the tournament. The Americans netted 13 goals, setting a World Cup single game scoring record. And four players reveled in the joy of capturing their first career World Cup goals. Shot taken, a goal, first World Cup goal. Fortunately, we had um, a couple of videos from the stands as well, getting to see their parents' reactions, which I thought was really special um, because our, you know, our parents are every part of this um, with us. So to be able to have, you know, Sam and Lindsay and Rose and Mal all scoring their first goals um, was, you know, I just felt a huge smile come across my face in the moment, and I was just excited for them. I see the whole iceberg. People see the tip of the iceberg. I've seen some of these players at 15 and 18, and, and you see what they've put into this and how hard they've worked. Um, and so to get to that point and scoring the first goal, it's, it's a truly an amazing, amazing part to, to share with them. People got their first World Cup goals. And I think that is what we were celebrating, if anything. You know, we were celebrating the fact that we are one team with multiple, um, you know, multiple threats. Alex Morgan put on a special record equaling performance, scoring five goals. Coach Ellis knew the importance of this team leader getting off to an electric start. Back post, header, go! Pull back, quick shot, and there's another! That is so difficult to do. Five for Morgan! Come on! It's her night! I think the, you know, the five goals was, was massive for her. You know, I said this afterwards, those were quality goals. Those weren't, you know, gimme goals, tapping goals. Those were world-class goals. And I think that also, it's not just about the number, it's about how you score. And I mean, they were fantastic. And I think that builds a player's confidence. I mean, I think she's ruthless and competitive and a very good teammate. I mean, an extremely good teammate and wants to win at all costs. and is super committed to the team. Oh, it was awesome. I was like, all right, Al's locked in for this tournament. We good, it's all good. <laughs> After the match, criticism arose about how the team had celebrated their many goals. Scoreline, it triggered a debate out there. Were the celebrations too much? The US confidence makes other teams uncomfortable. I think you just have to tone it down a little bit and kind of respect your opponent. They have embraced this arrogance and a brashness of almost a bully-esque type of stance. And we've questioned everything about this team, but they just win. I think we were so surprised by like the criticism from the first game um, in the scoreline and the celebrations. I was so excited and that's why it was so interesting afterwards that people were so upset about us celebrating because it's like, this is the World Cup. There's not a lot to talk about in a 13-0 win. You're not gonna see the performance of the team in those games. So, you know, talked about the celebrations and all that. So it was like, that was a kind of a perfect kind of microcosm um, of all of that. I think it's disrespectful to not give your best. Um, I think it's, you can't ask your players to just knock the ball around. There's, you know, you're trying to set this up for the next game and the next game. And so I think as a coach, you know, I, yeah, I'm willing to take that criticism because I think it, it did pave the way for us to build with confidence and, you know, have our, our scoring pl players hot in terms of, you know, feel in the back of the net. Coming up on USA Champions, the story of the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup. The USA-Sweden saga is always the talk of most tournaments, and I think 
We wanted to go out on top of our group, and we also wanted to send a message that it's a new era now. To become a world champion, a team must play seven grueling matches. After their dazzling performance against Thailand, the U.S. team made seven changes to the starting lineup for their second match against Chile. Going into the Chile game, it was great, I think, for the team to change up the lineup for many reasons. One was obviously knowing the tournament is very long and that us being the last group stage game had the least amount of days rest if we get to on the semifinal and the finals. The other thing was knowing the depth on this team and the fact that um, there's really possibility for 23 starters. But I think it's, it's smart of Jill to be able to do that, but I think it just brought the team even more together, having really all 20 field players able to play by the first two games, I feel like is just unheard of. You're playing seven games in, I think it's like 24, 26 days, and that takes a lot on your legs, it takes a lot on your body. and. To be able to come into a game and make, be able to have the confidence to make those seven changes is huge. You can't even overstate it to be able to rest players, to be able to play players and keep everyone's morale in a place. I think you could tell in all of the games we never ran out of gas. We always had that extra gear, whether it was subs coming in or players just on the field. Everybody back for Chile as Dahl Kemper floats one up. Blasted! What a goal for the U.S. Carly Lloyd. Davidson sending it across the line drive. Header up. Goal! Julie Ertz. It was important for me to, you know, be standing, cheering, and, and just giving them the energy that they need to continue just going into that game. And I think, you know, we all were so excited. Carly got her brace. Driven across. Headed down. Goal! Carly Lloyd's got two. U.S. has three. Juilliard's obviously doing Juilliard's thing, scoring from friggin' who knows where with the back of her head. How does she do it? I don't know. The power there and the placement from Juilliard's so good. It was an incredible feeling just knowing that we can now do what our teammates do for, for us. U.S. will be in first place now in Group F thanks to this victory today, 3-0 over Chile. This was an opportunity to at least secure our name in the next round and get us one step closer to winning the group because uh, to go into the third game with six points in a matchup with Sweden was was going to put us right where we wanted to be and those three points were huge. We went into the Chile game being like all right we proved a point against Thailand it's an opportunity to make another statement and um, I think that we did a great job doing that. We had uh, sort of different thoughts about it. Do you, do you go for six points right away and then, you know, rest your, your maybe your starters in the, in the Sweden game? And the way I looked at it is like we had to be, I knew these first two games wouldn't be as um, challenging potentially in terms of, you know, the demand set on us as the Sweden game. And what 2015 gave me was a blueprint to know that if you come through that, that group stage and you are battle tested, you go into the knockout rounds with kind of that, you know, you're amped up and you're ready to go. So I felt like the Sweden game, we had to make sure that those players kind of got back into it, refocused. It's a matchup we've been waiting for. Longtime rival Sweden and the U.S. collide with the top spot in Group F hanging in the balance. The final match of group stage was against a familiar foe. A draw against Sweden would put the U.S. squad on top of the group, which was the team's plan. However, the Americans were knocked out of the 2016 Olympics by the Swedes. So this game could also satisfy some desires for redemption. That was one of the hardest losses of my career. Coming off of a loss was always gonna make us feel like now we have to play catch up, now we have to get back to our winning ways. And I think, you know, we wanted to win. Of course, the USA-Sweden saga is always the talk of most tournaments. And I think we wanted to go out on top of our group and we also wanted to send a message that, yeah, what Sweden did to us in the Olympics, like, that's behind us. It's a new era now. I think we were lucky in that um, the Sweden game, you know, always has a little extra on it. Obviously, we knew that we were going through and, you know, we didn't necessarily have to win that game. But being able to kind of switch over and have a more competitive game in that one, something that had 
you know, obviously a good team, but then like that little extra sort of nervous feeling, I think was good. Rapino sends it in low near post. It's flicked in front, and the US is on top. Lindsay Horan will get her second of this World Cup. Well, the US is pouring it on again in the second half. The US wins the game to nothing. They also win the group. had scored the most goals of any team by the end of group stage. But they had also posted three clean sheets, which was the first time ever for the U.S. in a World Cup. The defense was proving all the early doubters wrong. I was so proud of the back line. We need everybody to keep the ball out of the back of the net. So I feel like, you know, that's an amazing stat right there in itself. And it just shows that, you know, I, we've never doubted our back line. We've never doubted each other. You know, there were some challenging moments leading into the World Cup, but I think stepping out of group play, not giving up a goal is something definitely to be celebrated. As a defender, it means a lot to get a clean sheet every single time and to go through the group stage of a World Cup and not get a goal scored on us was huge. Ultimately, what the players did on the pitch to keep clean sheets, you know, there's no better substitute for building confidence than that. And so I think they had a good feeling. There was a consistency in the group. Um, you know, and I think that they came out of it really feeling like they were ready to roll. Coming up on USA Champions. I think we felt really good about the group stage games, but we also knew that now it was going to be an extremely difficult road to the final, given we had Spain and then most likely France. women's national team had come out on top of the group stage. 18 goals scored, zero allowed, and they led all teams in ball possession. But the knockout round would push them to their limits. Spain proved to be a major test of physical and mental strength. I think Graham, one of my assistants, said, you know, Spain could have been in the banana peel, meaning that it's a game that you could slip up on. It was the first game where it was lose and go home on the line, and I think for myself, I, I felt the nerves of that. Anything can happen. At any point, World Cup is such a precarious thing. You're just on the edge of it could potentially go one way or the other. As a defender, at least, that's how you feel because you could make one mistake and it's the end of the tournament. We're capable of responding and handling ourselves in any situation. I think that's what makes this team so great is that people think that we come off as extremely confident, but it's because we're so prepared. Spain was an intense game. Uh, we always knew Spain was like this dark horse of the World Cup, but I never thought they were under the radar. I thought that they were so good. They are super technical, but we did not expect them to be as physical as they were. The Spain players were leaving all they had out on the field in this round of 16 game. Tobin Heath was tripped inside the box and drew a foul. The U.S. got set for their first penalty kick of the World Cup, something they were very prepared for. So this is crazy, like almost, almost a year out from the World Cup. And I said, you know, one of the things I really want to focus on is penalty kicks. I said, let's make this feel like, okay, this is just another phase, another part of the game. So here's Megan Rapino to give the USA the lead. Steps up slowly, Rapino shot, goal, US leads. I feel so confident in Pino anytime she's there. She is a baller and I feel like she's on another level. The initial PK was successful. It would be the first of two in this game. But a less pleasant first was about to take place. Turn over there. That's Hermoso. And there's the goal. Shutout's gone. 1-1. And it's so sloppy out of the back by the U.S. It was the first game that we let in a goal. And I think we definitely had to bounce back from that. But the team responded so well. I've learned as a goalkeeper you have to have bit of short-term memory and can't dwell on any goals that go in because you're going to have to be prepared to do something else at some point during the game. And the faster you can move on from any goal and, you know, kind of refocus and prepare for whatever's coming next is the better off you're going to be. It was good to have that bit of, 
oh, like, we got to grind it out. We got to figure out how to win this game. We got scored on. How do we rebound from that? How do we respond as a team? It wasn't the greatest in terms of um, performance level. But I also think that as a coach, you always want those games. And I think we had been comfortable in most of our games, getting the early goal. And so it was a game that kind of had that gut check feeling about it that I think in retrospect you need to feel that pressure to be able to then know that you can you know, push through and get it done. So I think it was an important game to have before the France game. The draw for the World Cup took place on December 8th of 2018. When the groups were selected, a wonderful yet devastating scenario was born. The US and France would likely meet in the quarterfinals. This tremendous matchup would come too soon in the tournament. There was a lot of hype. There was hype before the World Cup even started. I remember our little mini training camp before the World Cup. The questions I was asked was, USA France, what do you think? Playing against France in Paris in the quarterfinals, obviously you're playing the host country, and not just any host country, but a very talented and, and dangerous host country. We wanted to be there, and we wanted to beat this team, and we wanted to be prepared to do that. Probably one of the biggest games I've ever played in my life, for sure, in terms of the hype around it. I deleted Twitter before that game because I was like, I'm over it. I don't wanna I don't wanna hear people talking about us thinking that we're gonna lose or expecting us to lose or predicting it. I was done with it. I was like, delete, we're done. I don't need it. It was not even what was at stake here in terms of the result and advancing. It was just the most intensive, most hyped game. The cool thing was is we had literally from January to this point planned and prepared and gone through a lot of different ways that we were gonna manage this game. I think we had a really good game plan going into it. And that was like the only game that didn't feel like a home game. It was really cool to be a part of. And I think afterwards it was like, wow, we beat the home team in front of, I don't even know how many people. I always knew I had a big job going into that game. I had to hype myself up for literally 90 minutes and like talk myself up and, and, and just be in the zone and mentally focus throughout the whole game. Don't tune out for one second. If you tune out, one player's running behind you and then they're getting in. So it was like really staying in the game and in the zone for the whole time. The U.S. continued their trend of scoring early. In the fifth minute, Megan Rapino saw an opening as she prepared to take a free kick. Patented fast throw in. Um, me and Alex have like telepathy going on with that. Uh, and they only put two in front of the wall and left basically a huge gap to, you know, go right to that near post. Um, obviously, you know, JJ crushing near post is a total nightmare and she somehow beats everyone there every time. So I just tried to put it in a good spot. Rapino sends it in low. Go, US! And then in the 65th minute. Cross, Rapino shot, go! 2 the US! Just great build-up play from Alex and Tobin, just keeping the ball. But Tobin is unpredictable with her crosses because she dribbles so long. I'm always like, like, dang it! So they all kind of like crash near post, and then I was like, oh my god, it's coming through. I did have the moment. I'm like, oh, this is not real. Like this is just basically a wide open tap in on the back post. This is amazing. French defender Wendy Renard changed the momentum of the game in the 85th minute when she headed the ball past Alyssa Nair to bring France within one of the Americans. But it wasn't enough. That is it. U.S. advances. The French are up. Tobin was actually the one who said, you know, we won this game, but Tomorrow we wake up and our full focus on, is on England. We haven't done anything yet. We want a quarterfinal in the World Cup. We want to win the World Cup. Should have been a final, but was a quarterfinal. And only one team was coming out on top. It was pretty intense, to be honest, in the game. But it was the game that we needed. It was the game that we live for. Coming up on USA Champions. It was quickly a mindset switch of, okay, this is going to be a PK and how can I focus? and just kind of clear my mind a little bit and took a few deep breaths. I mean, England, you know, the US, we've been going back and forth and battling for years now, and they've always given us a run for our money. So um, we knew it was gonna be a tough game and I was, Super hyped for that game. 
The third-ranked Lionesses had only allowed one goal in their five games, and striker Ellen White had scored five times. Many were looking forward to the possible matchup between Megan Rapino and English star Lucy Bronze. But Megan had picked up an injury in the quarterfinals. We knew we were sitting on some potential issues. I think the day after, you know, when, when Megan got evaluated, um, you know, it was pretty clear it would be a real stretch. She knew what was at stake. She put her teammates first in that moment. So the decision was made, um, and then you know, we made the decision to start Pressy in the 11, and, and obviously it was you know, a great decision. We lost a great player that game, but we also gained a great player. Press was incredible, and I think, again, like, it's a testament to the depth of this team. Yeah, I think we were all super confident Press is sick. Like, she's so good, so I think it was, like, awesome to have her start and have such an impact on that game. Kristen Press had the full confidence of the team. In the 10th minute, Kelly O'Hara fed her the ball, and when the play was complete, Kristen raised her arms to celebrate with her beloved mother who had unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Oh, let go nicely by Laval. Right side, cross! Go! Press! I feel really, like, fortunate to have been around that and to be kind of one of her people in that um, environment. It just was like... There's, like, nothing better than having her, you know, have that beautiful moment and celebrate with her mom. Birthday girl Alex Morgan had not scored since her stunning five-goal performance in the opener versus Thailand. Described as a fierce competitor by her teammates, there was no doubt she would find the back of the net again soon. Horan, setting it in there, header, go! Happy birthday, Alex Morgan! It just has to do with Sophie Turner, who always posts on her Instagram story something funny or ridiculous, and afterwards she says, and that's the tea. Chandler was clearly the most attractive in France, and that's the tea. All of the criticism we had gotten through the tournament for our celebrations or for the most ridiculous reasons, um, I just thought it was um, quite funny to be able to just do, and that's the tea. And I did that celebration, and obviously there was more criticism. <laughs> Alex Morgan, all the haters that are saying that this was disrespectful, um, I'm honored that you thought of me and uh, all those people that are hating on you are probably sitting at home, millennials drinking kombucha. Um, and I'm really proud of you, Alex Morgan. Congratulations on your win. And that's the tea. While the internet began debating if Alex's tea sipping was in good taste or not, the focus on the field shifted to goalkeeper Alyssa Nair. Driven, nailed a terrific save. It was a big save. It was definitely a big save because one, I don't think a lot of us saw that shot coming. It was kind of like a quick ball played back and then she one-timed it um, so quick that we didn't even have time to like really step our line up. So of course it was an amazing save and it obviously was going in. So that was very big time. And I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Nayer would be called on again late in the second half. Defender Becky Sauerbrunn made slight contact with Ellen White and VAR confirmed it was a penalty. Ellen was making a good run to, to the ball that was being crossed, and I thought Becky played it as well as she, as well as she could have and should have. Um, you know, sometimes things happen and doesn't fully work out. In front way, she went down in the box. Penalty. England will have a chance to tie. I mean, you can go through an entire tournament without facing a PK. Um, but that doesn't change the number of hours that we've put into training, the timing, and the, you know, seeing them over and over and over and practicing them every single day. When the moment does come, we're ready and able to execute. It actually felt eerily quiet in the stadium. I don't know if it was or not, but I didn't hear anything. You know, it's just, it was a singular focus in that moment. On the whistle, Houghton is ready, so is Nair. Houghton shot, saved by Nair! Alyssa that Nair. is Alyssa Nair's World Cup moment. She has silenced her doubters. Alyssa Nair, thank you so much. I mean, massive props to Alyssa, and everybody's looking at that game. But I'd seen a woman that had just grown in her confidence. I think she's a very humble player. 
um, doesn't like the attention, doesn't like the spotlight. But I think internally that was a massive moment for her. And then immediately she's getting players out of her face to start our transition. And that's a player that's locked on. And it, I just spoke volumes about it. Just trying to get everybody to, to go so that, you know, we could, we weren't going to get called for some silly indirect free kick just because I held on to the ball for too long celebrating. It was a quick excitement and then it was, I got to close out the game. After the save, I remember thinking, we're winning this game. We're winning this game because there can't possibly be anything crazier that happens in this game. And, yeah. you know, after Liz made that save, I was like, we owe it to Liz now that we have to win this game. You know, she comes up big twice, uh, two key saves. And I feel like that's, that's why we play this game for those moments to give us hope and like promise to finish the game out. Uh, yeah, I think I took a few years off my life for sure. Um, but it was, it was what you want a semifinal of a World Cup to be. Coming up on USA Champions, the story of the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup. And the rock star that is Megan Rapinoe. With the talent and depth on this squad, is a less than fully fit Megan Rapinoe as good as maybe a fully fit Christian Press. Everybody knows the badges never die. Six games, six victories, but the toughest task was in front of them. Megan Rapino and Rose Lavelle were both battling hamstring injuries, which made the starting lineup uncertain for the final. I thought that I was going to be ready. You know, match day minus one, day before the game, I had to, I had to get into a sprint, and I was like, well, here we go. <laughs> this could come totally apart, but. Whatever. A couple days before the game, I was like, I was pretty nervous. I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to play. I was kind of like, I hope I can make it 45 minutes. I said to Rose that the, the night before the game, I said, listen, give us as much as you can for as long as you can. She, okay, I mean, it, absolutely stunning that she gave us what she gave us in terms of minutes. I don't know, someone was watching over me because I didn't feel my hamstring once and it was great. Stay the same for my people, yeah. Alex Morgan, the face of the team, but it always seems like Alex has had to prove that she belongs in the world's best talk. For Alyssa Nair, she began this tournament as a question mark. Love them or hate them, so they answer to no one but themselves. They are arrogant, they are provocative, but ultimately, this is a team that wins. It's important to feel confident going into games. You don't want to think, oh my gosh, we're gonna, we might not win this. We obviously studied a lot up on the, the Netherlands and they were a good team throughout the whole World Cup. But I think it's important that we obviously did feel that, that unity, that togetherness going into the final because we've, we've gone through so many challenging moments. And I think for us, we were just on top of the world thinking, We've gone through everything. Like, we need to win this final now. We are a confident team, but it's from preparation. So there wasn't a, an over, there wasn't this overconfidence going into the game. It was, this is going to be a grind, and it's 90 minutes. We have one more game. Like, this all means nothing unless we come out on top. There was just no way that we weren't winning <laughs> the game. The eyes of the soccer world on Lyon today for the conclusion of the biggest event in women's sports. I'm not sure I buy this underdog tag. This is the Dutch nation that are synonymous with success. Can the Netherlands pull off one of the greatest upsets in World Cup finals history? For the first time in the tournament, the Americans ended the first half without a goal. The Dutch goalkeeper had stopped every U.S. shot. A sold-out stadium and millions watching around the world were on the edge of their seats, wondering if the U.S. would break through. We didn't play badly in the first half. We just couldn't, you know, couldn't find a goal. And the message was just, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's coming. We could feel it was coming. We felt like we dominated the first half. We were attacking together. We were defending together. Um, we created a lot of chances. And, and our halftime talk was basically like, we need to put this ball in the net. We can't let any team hang around in a final because it takes one moment for them to gain momentum. Then we need to go up another gear, start of the second half. In the 58th minute, Alex Morgan drew a foul. After a three minute VAR review, Megan Rapino lined up for a crucial penalty kick once again. I'm not gonna lie, when Pino stepped up to take the penalty kick and, and I knew that you know the goalkeeper from Holland was just really good. 
I was like, all right, I'm just got to trust her on which way she goes. But I, you know, you just knew that the goalkeeper had scouted the previous penalty kicks. There's just places that goalkeepers are never going to reach if you hit it right. They can go early and you can't step off the line now, so it's difficult for them to sort of get um, a jump on it. But I was just thinking to myself, like, she's very good and very long and has the ability to stretch very far. And if she's watched any of my penalties, obviously throughout the tournament, but even like the last probably three years in the NWSL, um, in any sort of big pressure moment, I've gone sort of high left for power. And so I decided to go, go the other way. I just feel like it would throw her, throw her off um, a little bit. But I'm cold. Pino is a stone cold killer. Pino is uh, is the heart of the team, and she is someone you want on the field. She's someone you want to be friends with off the field, and just her having ice in her veins for those penalties, clutch. Rapino's sixth goal of the World Cup would ultimately clinch the Golden Boot and shifted the momentum of the game in her team's favor. Eight minutes later, Rose put her ailing hamstring to the test. Crystal had an incredible tackle, like she did the whole tournament. Sam picked up the ball, drew a player in, and then dished it to me. And then Alex was like peeling out. And I think the center back was like kind of trying to read that run a little bit. So I just kept taking space and then took a shot. Rose up the middle, cutting, shooting, go! Bravo to the US! She's been the breakout star of this tournament and the creative maestro so far. Oh, Rose had the tournament of her life. She played so well and she was so great for us. I just can't even express the amount of pride that I have watching Rose do so well. She's amazing. She's a superstar. U.S. players waiting to join the on-field celebration that is probably seconds away. They know what's coming. That's it, U.S. wins their fourth World Cup. I just remember as soon as the whistle blow, just a, a huge smile. I remember Becky turning around and running to me. Once the immediate um, excitement and chaos kind of ended and finished, I just remember taking a, a walk off on my own to, to midfield and just kind of taking a deep breath and, and kneeling down for a second. 23 players, it took that many to get the job done and, and we all know that and so I was just thankful when the final whistle blew. We were world champs again and it was the best feeling in the world. Coming up on USA Champions. This one feels like everyone feels like they won. And I think it was just so inspiring to people and something good that they could hop onto. It's fun to be able to finally celebrate. You know, you want to celebrate so many times throughout the World Cup and you finally are like, okay, it's done, we won. We can enjoy it and celebrate. And we got to do that as a team with our staff in the locker room and then with all our friends and family afterwards in Lyon. It had been so serious up to that point, so focused that we were actually able to let loose and enjoy with each other. So we were just having the time of our lives after. I'm here with my 22 best friends. Found a 23rd yesterday, world champs, heading back to New York. See you soon at the parade. Just landed in America, ready to celebrate, ticker tape parade and all. Here we go, ladies. Time to show off the goods. Breaking back to back World Cup winning US.
U.S. soccer team. just be known as America's team. Here's to the next chapter. Maybe we'll see you in another four years. Celebrations span the country, and the competitive fatigue of the tournament was replaced with joyful exhaustion. Eventually, the players returned to their NWSL teams. Soccer resumed. It's too soon to know the historical impact of this World Cup and this world champion team, but we know for sure that the future is brighter with a fourth star over the USA crest. Man, oh man. Uh, it was powerful, I would say. You know, that's the first word I think that comes to mind. We're a force to be reckoned with, and we are somebody who uh, is always going to rise to the challenge. Whatever we're faced with, we're always going to, you know, prove that we are the best. And this World Cup, everyone has said it already, was the most competitive World Cup ever. And we want that. We want every team to be competitive and put out their best play because we don't want the world to only just be watching us. We want the world to be watching women's soccer across the world. It was just a showcase of a World Cup, of a world event that brought out the best. And now probably sent messages around the world. Hey, this is the sport. You need to invest. You need to continue to support this. You know, I said a long time ago to the team, you know, the. Getting to the summit is incredibly hard, but you don't live on the summit. You know, the air's thin, it's a crowded spot, you, you get to visit it. And so to get back up there again um, with a, you know, a different team, really, it, it, was, it was just amazing. I mean, just pure joy. understand just how like emotionally exhausting this whole journey is. Um. It's the best feeling to win. It's the best feeling. I think that we'll continue to be the team that everyone expects us to be. This team is bigger than football and it's bigger than a sport. We're a movement right now and it's pretty cool to be a part of it and I think that we all have a platform and I think that we're all using it in a way to better the world. You know, it means so much more for what we're fighting for, for what we stand for, for um, the NWSL, and um, to keep that stable and running and, and thriving. Yeah, it was, it was huge for this country. It's so much bigger than soccer. Not that the soccer part is an afterthought, but it, it almost feels like that. This one feels like everyone feels like they won. It was just so inspiring to people, and this just feels like such a, a bigger thing than anything that we did on the field. I think that we have a really incredible opportunity here to shift a national narrative and who we want to be as, as a people. Together.